Hello and welcome. Great to have you join us electronically this morning as we fellowship at Heartland or as Heartland, I guess we could say. This is certainly a change, isn't it? Certainly a change on my end, and I know it's a change on your end to be fellowshipping electronically like this. And by the way, I want to express thanks to you for the notes I received this past week via text or in a posting or even a phone call. Much appreciated, very encouraging. Thank you very much for that. But we are certainly experiencing changes. Even the fact that we're getting together like this is an evidence of that change we're going through. Last week at Hartford City, a level orange travel warning or advisory was issued. And just yesterday, Marion County, which is where Indianapolis is, went to a level red warning. Anxiety is running high. A work associate flat out on Friday just said, I am very anxious about all of this. And we find it necessary in our many staff meetings in the morning during the workaday week to talk about the irritation that we're experiencing. All of us, it's kind of all around and what to do with that. Even our executive leadership and communications that come to us frequently have talked to us about people being afraid, patients, staff, callers, and what a necessity we should do in response to that. Where do you go? What do you do when uncertainty, fear, anxiety comes to you? where you live. Where do you go with that? Well, you know, I am very grateful that we come to Psalm 46 this morning. Psalm 46 has been in the planning for several weeks now, and this morning, it's almost as if God knew. Of course, being omniscient, he did know, and he does know what our need is. And Psalm 46 speaks to us very powerfully about that. This past week, I've thought about Psalm 46, given attention to it, and it's with joy that we have an opportunity to look at it together this morning. Dr. Stewart has the opportunity to take us into the text, and we will do that, Psalm 46, and hear where to go with clarity as God speaks to us at such a time as this. Dr. Stewart. Hello. Good to see you here in the comforts of home. You can see there that's a fuzzy slipper and um, just getting comfortable. Hope you get comfortable too. We're talking about God's promises. Psalm 46, God is our refuge. We'll talk about a story that's based on 2 Kings 18 and 19. God takes care of his people. The Bible's full of examples of God's protection. I want to share one of these with you from the Old Testament that encouraged me to understand the extent. It, it, it um, encouraged me at this time when I just was starting to get become aware of this pandemic with COVID-19. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 18. At that time, the people were not listening to God. They were worshiping idols and going their own way. God uh, raised up Hezekiah, a righteous king, verse 3. He was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as David. Verse 4, he removed the pagan shrines, smashed the the sacred pillars, and cut down the Asherah poles. Verse 5, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah. He remained faithful to the Lord in everything and carefully observed all the commands the Lord had given Moses. 
Verse 7, so the Lord was with him. He revolted against the king of Assyria and refused to pay him tribute. Verse 13, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, King Sennacherib, who we'll refer to as King Senna, he came to attack the fortified cities of Judah and conquered them. King Hezekiah sent this message to the king of Assyria, I have done wrong. I will pay whatever tribute you demand if you will only withdraw. Hezekiah paid the tribute, 11 tons of silver and one ton of gold. He had to take gold from the doorposts in the temple to meet this payment. Verse 17, nevertheless, the king of Assyria sent his leaders and a huge army to confront Hezekiah in Jerusalem. The Assyrian king sends the message to Hezekiah. What are you trusting in that makes you so confident? Do you think that mere words can substitute for military skill and strength? Maybe you're trusting in Egypt to help you, but Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he's a wimp. It doesn't say that exactly. That's my translation, but you can't rely on him. But perhaps you'll say to me, we're trusting in the Lord our God. Verse 25, do you think we, the Assyrians, have, have invaded your land without the Lord's direction? The Lord himself told us, attack this land and destroy it. Oh, which Lord does that sound like who told Assyria to attack Israel? Sounds a bit like Satan, doesn't it? Then the leaders speak to the people of Israel. Verse 27, and when we put this city under siege, they will suffer along with you. They will be so hungry and thirsty, they will eat their own dung, and they will drink their own urine. Yeah. Listen to this great message from the great king of Assyria. Don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He will never be able to rescue you from my power. Don't let him fool you into trusting in the Lord by saying, the Lord will surely rescue us. Verse 31, don't listen to Hezekiah. Make peace with me and open the gates and come out. Verse 32, then I will arrange to take you to another land like this one, a land of grain with new wine and breads and vineyards and olive groves and honey. Choose life instead of death. Verse 35, what God of any nation has ever been able to save its people from my power? So what makes you think the Lord can rescue Jerusalem from me? The people's the people of Israel's response is impressive. They're unified behind Hezekiah. Verse 36, but the people were silent and did not utter a word because Hezekiah commanded them, don't answer him. Uh, chapter 19, verse 1, when Hezekiah heard this report, he tore his clothes and put on burlap and went into the temple of the Lord. Hezekiah spoke with his leaders to Isaiah the prophet. Today is a day of trouble, insults, and disgrace. It's like when a child is ready to be born, but the mother has no strength to deliver the baby. They were totally without strength, helpless and afraid. Hezekiah con continues, But perhaps the Lord your God heard the Assyrian king defying the living God and will punish him for his words. Hezekiah receives one more warning in a letter, which says, in summary, we will destroy you. Hezekiah goes to the temple to pray. Verse 15, O Lord, God of Israel. Now this is, this is good. Now get this, this prayer. O Lord, God of Israel, you're enthroned between the mighty cherubim. You alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heavens and the earth. Bend down, O Lord. Bend down and listen. Open your eyes and see. Listen to Sennacherib's words of defiance against the king. I'm sorry, defiance against the living God. Verse 19, now, O Lord, rescue us. And the, that's the NLT, but the ESV says this. It says, save us, please. I really like that. Save us, please, from his power. Then all the kingdoms of the earth will know you alone, O Lord our God. Then Isaiah prophesies about the king of Assyria. His armies will not set foot in Jerusalem. They will not even shoot one arrow. 
They won't even march outside your gates. The king will return to his own land. He will not enter the city of Jerusalem. For my honor, I will defend this city and protect it, God says. Verse 35, that night, the angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. When the surviving Assyrians woke up, they were surrounded by corpses everywhere. The king, Senna, Senna sounds a little like Senna of Assyria, broke camp and returned home to Nineveh and stayed there. One day he was worshiping in the temple and his god Nishrak and his two sons killed him with their swords. Hezekiah's prayer. Once again, now, O oh Lord, our God, please save us. Rescue us from his power. Then all the kingdoms of the earth will know that you alone, O oh Lord, our God, our great deliverer. God listened. You know, God is still our great deliverer, isn't he? In the days of COVID virus. Let's read together the promises that are here in Psalm 46. I'm reading from the NLT. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble at the water's surge. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos and their kingdoms crumble. God voice, God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Come see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire, or in other versions, the chariots with fire. Verse 10, be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the earth. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. God is our refuge. What is a refuge? A shelter, a retreat, a harbor in the time of a storm, a place you run to in times of trouble. It is not the temple or the prayer room or the church building. It is God we're fleeing to, God himself. Even though Hezekiah went to the temple to pray, his focus was on God and nothing else. Nothing else would do. King Senna and his armies were like a wolf attacking a helpless lamb. He was so much stronger than Israel. There was no contest. Remember, Hezekiah described Israel like a woman delivering a baby who was too exhausted to deliver, completely spent, no strength of her own. Why was Israel afraid? Everything the king could do to them, he could cut off their food and water, starve them out. He could come against them and destroy them as he had so many other nations. As I started studying this passage, the pandemic was starting, was just coming to light. As a healthcare worker, I've spent many hours since studying that situation and worrying about it. I've been afraid at times for my own safety, although there's still not a single case in Blackford County. It's all around us but also the safety of so many others. I've been more worried about others, our patients, our colleagues. You know, my daughter sent me a YouTube video of an ICU nurse in New York City on the front lines pleading for ventilators. They were just barely keeping up. And personal protective equipment, PPE, we call it, they needed more. It wasn't adequate. There were refrigerator trucks outside the hospital 
to store the dead because the morgue of the hospital was full. Are you afraid? This passage is very practical for you. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. The NLT says, always willing to help in times of trouble. He is with us in the trouble, and even though we don't understand it, he is in it for good for us. Verse 2, so we will not fear. If we see God in his infinite greatness, everything else comes into perspective. Proverbs says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we fear him, which includes love and respect and even trembling fear to some extent, because God is one to be feared, but to be loved and respected as well. For us, all, all at once. Above all, every other fear falls into place as we have the proper fear of God. Verse 2, what kinds of things are spoken of? Physical disasters, earthquakes, a little tremor? No. It's a massive earthquake able to level a mountain. Not waves on a lake, but oceans, raging, roaring whitecaps, massive waves, the power of the ocean in a storm, like in the movie Perfect Storm, where the waves dwarf the little ship. They're much bigger and more powerful. It brings to mind Jesus who spoke to the wind and the waves, peace be still, and it was peaceful and still. The mountains tremble at the force of these waters. Surging suggests a flood or a tsunami. Both can be terrible physical disasters. But notice the contrast. There is the raging waves, destructive, loud, chaotic. But in verse 4, the, here's the contrast. A river brings joy to the city of God. In many cities of the world, there's large, powerful rivers, but in Jerusalem, there's a silent little stream which flows called Shiloh. It's gentle and quiet. Psalm 23, 2 says, He leads me beside still waters, peaceful streams. And for a sheep, you know, a sheep can drown in rough water. It needs to drink from still streams, and God gives us just what we need. Calm, quiet refreshment. There is a river at the start and at the end of the Bible. In paradise, in Genesis 2.10, a river that flowed out of Eden to water the garden. In the book of Revelation 22.1, then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God, and of the Lamb through the middle of, the, of that city, the city, the new Jerusalem, heaven. Notice it was the water of life, not a physical river, but a spiritual one. Jesus spoke to the woman of the well in John 14, 13. I'm sorry, John 4, 13. Anyone who drinks this water, referring to the physical well water, will soon be thirsty again. But those who drink the water I will give them will never be thirsty again. It becomes fresh, bubbling springs within them, giving them eternal life. This is a living relationship with God that comes as his spirit comes inside of us. We can come into this relationship with God by admitting that I'm a sinful person. That's not too hard if we're honest, right? I mean, when you think of thoughts and words and deeds, I'm a sinful man. I really need a Savior. You really need a Savior. We see our physical need now. With coronavirus, we need God to deliver us from the fear and effects of this infection for us, for those around us. But as we have sin, we break God's law. We deserve his punishment. But Jesus took our punishment on the cross. We simply trust him. He takes away our sin and gives us his own righteousness. He never committed sin and he loved always. Not me.
I don't love as I should. Jesus was always right, and he gives that to me. I am made right with God, and I come into a living relationship with God, living water in me. John Gill says this, living water which quickens or brings life to dead sinners and revives drooping saints. I like that. Do you feel droopy? Get some water. Get some living water. You see, it's not only quickening life-giving to those who are lost, but it also strengthens the droopy saints. Verse 4, this brings joy to our hearts. Even in the middle of dark night and the trouble, there is happiness in knowing God and knowing he lives in you. But our individual joy is not the point in verse 4. It contributes, but it's a corporate joy. The whole city, Jerusalem, was the city of God. And when this was written, but whatever, wherever God dwells, there's joy. And his greatest joy is found in rescue. We see that in the New Testament in Luke 15, 7. He says there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and returns to God. Heaven celebrates. That's our home, our city as believers. Verse 4, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. In our study about Hezekiah and Sena, the Assyrian king was threatening to invade and destroy Jerusalem. 2 Kings 19, Isaiah prophesied the armies, the armies will not enter Jerusalem. The king will not enter this city. The Lord said, 1934, I will defend this city and protect it. God stands with his people. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. The ESV says, she shall not be moved. It's impossible to come against God and win. Those who try it end up frustrated and many and defeated and many are dead. This reminds me of what Jesus said about the church. Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Verse 5, in the ESV, God will help her when morning dawns. Notice it's not before morning dawns or as the morning dawns. The help is proximate to the need. When we really need it, he delivers. Why does he wait? He wants us to trust him, to need him, to depend on him. He wants our hope and our faith to be exercised. He comes at just the right moment. In the Lord of the Rings, the return of the king, our heroes have returned or retreated to Helm's Deep to face a massive army of orcs. And they're losing and they're almost ready to concede. The orcs are breaking down the door into the inner sanctuary and... Just at that moment, a light shines in the window. In the morning of the third day, they remember the promise of the rider on the white horse. Gandalf the White gallops in with a massive counter force, which defeats the enemy. It started at morning's first light. And in our story, 2 Kings 19.35, when the people arose early in the morning, dead bodies everywhere. McLaren says this, in the hour of greatest need, not too soon for fear and faith, not too late for hope and help, when the morning dawns, when the appointed hour of deliverance, which he alone determines has struck, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons, but this we know, that he is Lord of time. He who is Lord of time will ever save at the best possible moment. He will not come so quickly as to prevent us from feeling our need. He will not tarry so long as to make us sick and hope with hope deferred. Or so long that the enemy fulfill his purpose, our destruction. At just the right moment, he shows up to answer our prayers as he promised. Verse 6, the nation's rage. The ESV says that that is true today as people still hate and persecute the people of God around the world and here in the United States, too. The enemies have come to kill and destroy, but the voice of God speaks. Thunder is heard in the earth 
and the opposition melts. Verse 6, the kingdoms crumble. In our story, the angel of the Lord is sent to take out the Assyrian army in a, in a moment. A great army is annihilated. A great king who mocked God is defeated. He leaves with his tail between his legs. He runs home and is killed with his own sword. 2 Kings 19.7, as Isaiah the prophet prophesied. And their kingdoms crumble. In the NLT, verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. Hosts are heaven's armies. The commander of heaven's armies has immeasurable power. God is with us, the presence of God. Strickland says this. He takes a look at the presence of God, the three ways that it shows up. Number one, the glorious presence of God. God is upon his throne, as in Isaiah. Isaiah saw his throne and the seraphim, there was smoke that filled the temple, and the seraphim covered their face and their feet, and they were flying and crying out one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The glorious presence, the gracious presence. He extends his help or his grace to man. He is present in the temple, particularly between the cherubim on the ark, 2 Samuel 6, 2 a place where his people Israel could worship him. He is present with us, his church, and where he says this in the New Testament, for where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them, Matthew 18, 20. We're separated as a body right now, but where there are two or three gathered in each home, there's God's presence with us. Very cool. Last, the protective presence. He offers assistance and defense. We saw this with the Israelites when they left Egypt. The Lord went before them in a cloud, a pillar of cloud to guide and block the sun, and a pillar of fire by night which led them and warmed them. When the Egyptians chased them, the pillar of cloud and fire blocked Egypt, but led Israel. So the Lord of hosts protects God's people as he did in our story. He is with us to protect us today against our enemies. And make no mistake, the coronavirus is an enemy. It comes through the fall. And it is, it is uh, as is all sickness, what is the worst thing that could happen with coronavirus? We could, what is the worst thing that could happen? We could die. Our physical bodies die, but our spirit it's trust to Jesus. It says to be absent from the flesh is to be present with the Lord and immediately go and be with God. That uh, doesn't sound so bad. Short of death, I could get the virus. Um, I could be harmed by it. No guarantee of, that I will or won't get this thing. But I trust that his purpose will be worked out as I walk with him through it, as I join God, as I'm doing this, I want to join God in what he's doing. And now he's in control over this. Will I trust him and walk with him through this pandemic? The God of Jacob is my fortress. He's an indestructible stronghold. Do you know that this psalm is based on a famous hymn? Can you see it here? In this verse, um, in verse 7, do you see what hymn is it? It's a mighty fortress is our God. Uh, this psalm is called Luther's psalm. It was said that in times of great trouble during the Reformation, Luther would encourage people to sing this psalm. The God of Jacob is spoken of here. Why? This reminds us of the covenant God made with Jacob, the promise God gave to Jacob to make him a great nation, and out of him would come the great king, the Messiah, Jesus, who would bless all nations of the earth. We're all blessed. The greatest promise, the gospel, living water, would come to us, has come to us. Verse 8, come see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction, desolations upon the world. We 
have seen it here in the destruction of the Assyrian army and king. And we've seen the plagues God unleashed on Egypt due to Pharaoh's stubbornness and cruelty. Joseph Hall says, See, therefore, what desolations the Lord has wrought in all the earth, desolations by war. How many fields have been drenched with blood and by the edge of the sword, desolations by famine, mass starvation, desolation by plague and pestilence, a single city, uh, 800,000 swept away in just one city. That's more than the current numbers of our pandemic. Desolations by flood, remember Katrina. Desolations by earthquakes, which have swallowed up whole cities. You know, all these things are terrible, but they pale in comparison to the day of the Lord. Isaiah 13, 9 says this, For see, the day of the Lord is coming, the terrible day of his fury and fierce anger. The land will be made desolate, and all the sinners destroyed with it. That's the desolation of desolations. God is in control of desolations. We clearly are not. It's not in our control. It's easy in these things to blame God. But God is never the author of sin or evil. We don't understand why these things come, this virus that we're dealing with, but we're, we're dealing with it. But desolations are the result of the fall of man. They come to us as kind of a fruit of man's sin in the garden. None of these things were present before sin entered the world. None of them will be allowed in heaven. Heaven will be a place with no sin, no tears, no pain, no sickness, no death. God, in fact, will wipe away every tear and be with us forever. Verse 9, he causes wars to end throughout the earth. God doesn't love war. In fact, he hates it, and he brings an end to it at times throughout history with brief periods of peace, but men can't get along. They're only short-lived. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. He will bring peace that will never end. Peace is made in two ways. First, by breaking down the walls of opposition in men and women's hearts and reconciling them to God. Second, we see in this passage, by demolishing the power of warfare, by taking away any device of war. Paul says this, when the Romans had conquered a people, they made peace. They collected the arms of the vanquished and set them on fire, reducing them to ashes. There is a medal of Vespasian, the Roman emperor. When he finished his wars in Italy and around the world, it shows the goddess of peace holding an olive branch in one hand and with a lighted torch in the other, setting fire to a heap of armor. Verse 9 in the ESV, he burns the chariots with fire. Chariots were greatly feared. Like modern-day tanks, they gave the operator a substantial advantage. It was nearly impossible to fight with regular ground forces against a chariot. Foot soldiers dreaded chariots, understandably, but when the cavalry feared them greatly, the, even the cavalry feared them greatly. The rushing sound of the wheels, the noise of the horses' hooves, and the shaking of the ground as chariots thundered along in your direction. He burns the chariots with fire, it says here. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord, our God, Psalm 20, verse 7. They made peace by their weapons and destroying them, but only true and lasting peace comes by changing men's hearts. Verse 10. As the nations raise, the sovereign Lord speaks again. He spoke and the earth melted. Now a word of encouragement to his people and a rebuke to any uh, who oppose him. He says these words. They have different meaning depending on who you are. Be still and know that I am God. For we take comfort. God, who is over our trouble, not only over it, but he's in it with us and he's in it. For our good, Romans 8.28, as men 
like King Sinna and any who oppose God's people in the Old and New Testament, like the Pharisees and even Saul, when you stand against God's people, you stand against who? You stand against God. God says, verse 10, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. You can do it now or you can do it later because Jesus willingly went to the cross to die for sinful people like you and I. Philippians 2, 9 and 10, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Under the earth, that's hell. Everyone bows, even devils, demons, angels, humans, all together will bow before the king. Teft says this, faith gives the soul a view of the greatness of God. The soul that lives in despair and the sinner who doesn't care are alike. Neither sees God as great. That is the cure to know that this is a great God that we serve. He reaches down to offer us this water of our life freely, even though he's the sovereign of the universe. He reaches down to each of us. You can trust him and not be afraid in a COVID virus pandemic. He is our fortress. He is our refuge. Verse 11, nothing comes to you but by his loving hand. Verse 11, the Lord of heaven's armies is with us. We're, we're all in this together, aren't we? We saw the people of God standing with Hezekiah as he asked them not to answer the pagan king, and they stood with him. We're called by our government leaders to practice staying at home, social distancing, washing our hands for 20 seconds, staying at home when you're sick. These are ways that we can partner with them. And I'm clearly convinced that uh, this is loving God and loving our neighbor. It's to prevent the spread of a deadly virus. This shows love for your neighbor. And it's very likely people's lives will be saved by these actions. Someone close to you, potentially, or someone you don't even know. Love God and love people. God is our refuge, a very present help in times of trouble. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this passage and the promises that it gives us of life and hope. And uh, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, we look to you in this time of trouble. Save us, Lord, individually and the people around us, people that are dying in these major cities like New York and Chicago and Indianapolis around us. God, be with the doctors and nurses that are managing them and help. We look to you and we trust you. We know that you are our refuge and our strength. We thank you for that it all comes to us through Jesus and his sacrifice by his death on the cross for us. Thank you for grace and the gospel, living water that's given to us freely by your hand, the sovereign God. We thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Over the top promises of God that he himself is our refuge, our strength, our fortress, a very present help. And indeed, when inordinate fear crops up, we can go to that God as our refuge and that fear give way. Thank you, Dr. Stewart, for reviewing this with us taking us in to Psalm 46. I hope this week you'll take some time to think us over during the course of your days. Bring this up again to mind. Even choose a passage or two to think about how, how do I make the Lord my refuge? As our wristbands that we've given out a while ago say, as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Psalm 73, 28. When we do that, 
when we draw near to God. He draws near he draws near to us as we draw near to God. He becomes our refuge and he works. He works. Fear can well give way. This week, take time to look that over. Also, bear in mind that we're speaking about Egypt here in our prayers to God. Egypt is the 16th most difficult country in the world where it is to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Next week, we're going to take a look at 2 Peter chapter 1. We're beginning at verse 5 as we look at these promises continue to unfold to us. As a matter of fact, there are three promises under one direction that he gives us there. Three promises come out to us, and we'll be taking a look at that. So you might look ahead and do that. Well, next Sunday we'll be meeting here again electronically. Slight change, though, because things are changing. We're going to look to go to a live stream, so we'll keep you informed of that electronically, of course, for our times right now. Take care. See you next week. Bye.